Uh, script for remotely conducted city council meetings, Monday, June 15th, 2020, confirming member access as a preliminary matter. This is Paul Gwensi, president of the Beverly City Council. Before beginning the meeting, I'd like to announce that this meeting is being recorded by the City of Beverly and live streamed on BevCam on both Channel 99 and via BevCam G2 channel. I'm confirming that all members and persons who participated on the agenda are present and can hear me. Can hear me. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Maria, you can hear me? Stacy, can you hear me? Great. Yeah. Ed, you can hear me. Thank you. Those not on the council, thank you for being here. And we really appreciate you being on our agenda. Uh, good evening. This is an open meeting of the Beverly City Council is being conducted remotely, consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020, due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of COVID-19. In order to mitigate the transmission of the virus, we've been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings, and as such, the governor's order suspended the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate. The order allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as adequate alternative public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation unless such participation is required by law. This meeting does have public participation. We have a few public speakers that would like to speak on something that is on our agenda, and we have three public hearings later in the evening. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and televised live and some attendees are participating by video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that other participants or viewers may be able to see and hear you and anything you broadcast may be captured by the recording. You have the option to turn off your video if you're participating via computer. All participants should keep their microphones or phones muted unless recognized by me to reduce background noise and feedback. Please wait until the person speaking is finished before speaking so we can clearly hear all participants. In addition, because of the remote meeting, I'm going to read Rule 22 of the Rules and Regulations of the Beverly City Council, because we will have subcommittee votes this evening. All subcommittees of the council shall cause records to be kept of their proceedings. They shall be reported by ordinance, order, or resolve, unless otherwise provided by law. No subcommittee shall act by separate consultation and no report of as a body shall be received unless agreed in subcommittee, actually notified and assembled for the purpose in hand and signed by the majority of the councils of the subcommittee. Every subcommittee to which any subject matter may be referred shall report thereon as soon as possible after full consideration thereof and a vote thereon. However, if the council may, by majority vote, order any matter pending before the subcommittee to be acted upon the subcommittee at its next meeting and or be with forth return to the full city council. So in order to, to get everything out of subcommittee, we need to take a roll call vote. Uh, yay would be good, and nays, uh, I would question why. So Ms. Kent, could you please uh, give us a roll call? Ames? Yay. Mr. Feldman? Clarence? Yay. Flowers? Yes. Brady? Yes. Houseman? Yes. Ram? <clears throat> yes. Latando? Yes. Guansi? Yes. So all that is in subcommittee and now before the full council. We do have three public hearings, so I need to read this also. Uh, meeting ground rules for public hearings. I will introduce each speaker on the agenda. After they include their remarks, I'll invite the council to provide any comment, questions, or motions. Please remember to mute your phone or computer when you're not speaking. You may mute yourself or be muted by the meeting host by clicking the microphone mute unmute icon, pressing the mute button on your telephone, or by pressing star six on your telephone keypad. Please reserve the chat function for technical difficulties and strictly the city council, not for public comments. Please try to speak clearly in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please state your name and affiliation before speaking. I know that we'll have people that want to speak on behalf of the public hearings, uh, and I will um, call on you as such. I suppose that if you want to speak in the during the public hearing, specifically on the matter at hand, you could use the chat function to let me know. Um, are we all good? 
Good. Great job so far. We got quite an agenda this evening. So I will say, call to order this uh, regular meeting of the Beverly City Council, Monday, June 15th, 2020. Ms. Kent, could you please call the roll? Ames? Here. Galvin? Clarity? Yeah. Flowers? Here. Ravens? Here. Houseman? Here. Rand? Here. Rotondo? Here. Nguatsi? I am here. Councilor Houseman, as you've done so well since we've gone remote, could you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Yes, Council President. I pledge allegiance to, to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Council Houseman. Um, I would entertain a motion to suspend our rules briefly so we may hear from Mayor Cahill. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Ames? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Flowers? Yes. 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 Houseman? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And Blancy? Yes. Mayor Cahill, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Mr. President, Mrs. Kemp, counselors, and, and everybody who's here in the meeting. Thanks for giving me a, a couple of minutes here. First, I want to say that I know that our Clean Energy Advisory Committee is here. There's a lot of reverb. You good there? Much better. I know that our Clean Energy Advisory Committee Chair, Julia Long, is going to be speaking in a couple of minutes about green municipal aggregation. I know several of us are really interested and excited about that, and I, I'm looking forward to hearing her remarks. Uh, two things that, that uh, I want to announce. First is that, um, and these both have to do with social justice and, and uh, rights of minorities in Beverly and elsewhere. Uh, first, we, we were able to have a, a very small um, flag raising ceremony this morning in front of City Hall of the uh, LGBTQ pride flag and, uh, and with it the trans flag. Uh, and I just want to say we, we've had the pride flag up for a couple of weeks, but we brought it down today to join it with the trans flag and have them both up there and they'll be proudly flying outside of City Hall for the rest of this month uh, in celebration of, of Pride Month. And I think it's important to note that, um, you know, wherever wherever the rights of anybody are threatened, we have to pay attention. And, and the rights of oppressed minorities uh, in this country, it's, it's a, a sad legacy in too many instances. And the rights of the LGBTQ community have been hard won and continue to be threatened at different levels, something that we can never take for granted and so I just want to say that's why we celebrate, why we mark, and why we honor our LGBTQ neighbors, friends, family members, coworkers uh, today and throughout the course of this month. And it's it's I'm I'm glad that we're uh, that we're able to be here and do that. We um, re related in that we're we're talking about also. Um, oh, and I just want to say that our several members of our Human Rights Committee were present today. Chief uh, Police Chief John Alasher, Leah Jones, our Human Rights Committee Chair, and Renee Gannon were uh, there with me to, to raise the flag today. And Matt from BevCam was, was there to give his services and help commemorate it. So thank you all. Uh, and also, I just want to say that um, in, in the wake of all that's gone on in, in recent weeks uh, concerning black lives, um, black rights in America, uh, we all understand that black lives absolutely matter to all of us and, and, and in this community, in this, in this country. Uh, the other day, a couple of our Human Rights Committee members asked to meet with me, uh, and Esther Nyoto and Chairwoman Leah Jones um, met with me and Councilors Flowers and Rand, uh, and also present in the meeting was Reverend Joan Amaral of, of our Beverly Zen Center. We had a great conversation, and it was, it was because Esther wanted to bring to me a proposal that she has, and she talked with the Councilors about, uh, for creating a, an office in Beverly of uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, and it's a really interesting concept, one that may well be our right next step to take. Uh, and so what I wanna just share with you now tonight is that uh, we are going to try to manage our budget, our FY21 budget, wherever it finally lands. We're gonna try to manage it 
so that we can hold aside 150 to 200 thousand dollars for a racial justice and equity initiative um, that we plan to spend some time this summer in a public conversation, uh, just just really kind of vetting how best to move forward in Beverly. And it may be it may well be that Ms. Nyoto's um, proposal is the right next step to take. That perhaps an office of of equity, inclusion, and diversity in the city of Beverly is the right step. So I don't want to, for a second, think that it's not. I just think we we want to take our time and, and really uh, have the conversation and kind of entertain all all the things that we might try to do next uh, and see what rises to the top and whatever it may be, whether it's to create that office or to do something else. My goal is that we spend some time this summer and that we're ready to come back to the council with a recommendation to take some money from within the budget and to repurpose it to to launch uh, our first initiative. Um, and so that that's the goal. I fully embrace and expect and hope that councilors will be part of that conversation, as will others. I want to mention, uh, Mr. President, that in speaking with you, you earlier, I understand that you also met um, with, uh, with Esther and Leah and a couple other folks. Uh, I think being careful to not violate open meeting law, Councilor Rand and you are not in the same meetings unless they're publicly posted, where you share a subcommittee assignment. Uh, but I know that you you spoke with me about about this initiative as well. So the real goal is to take some time over the next couple months and and really flesh out what we should be doing going forward and be ready to launch by fall. Um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to try to answer. But I do want to thank everyone who's been in the conversation to date, um, in particular, well, everyone, <laughs> and uh, Councillor Flowers and Rand and, and Mr. President, you've all been fantastic. So thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Anybody have a quick question for the mayor before we move on? All right, thank you, Your Honor. Thank you all. Uh, next up on our agenda, uh, we have two resolutions. One, order 135, Council Flowers on the Future Act, and then we have 136, Council Houseman on Green Municipal Aggregation. Um, Council Flowers, do you want to read your order? your resolution this evening, or do you want to hear from the two people that you've invited in to speak on behalf of it first? If it would be okay with you, Mr. President, I'd love to hear from uh, Mr. Hops and Mr. Wall first, if that's okay. Okay, why don't we go to Mr. Wall first, since he's visiting us all the way from Cambridge. Mr. Wall, thank you for being here. Let me oh, turn my microphone on. Thank you very much, Mr. President, members of the City Council and Mayor Cahill. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight to ask you to adopt a resolution supporting an act for utility transition using renewable energy called the Future Act. It's uh, Representative Ehrlich and Minicucci's Bill 2849 in the House and Senator Kring's Bill 1940 in the Senate. The Future Act addresses the dual challenge of over-dependence on natural gas and triaging repair of the decrepit gas distribution system and reducing gas greenhouse gas emissions as you transition to a clean energy future. It does so fairly and equitably and adds to the job growth we've experienced in the clean energy sector in this state. Fixing the leaks and the transition to clean energy are job creators. Installing heat pump technology uh, are new and modern jobs, whether air source, ground source, or geothermal district energy. As you may know, almost as many new leaks are found today as are repaired and we ratepayers pay for that leak gas. In Beverly alone, Beverly had a 141 run repaired leaks at the end of 2019, and only 149 had been repaired that year. That's two, oh, well, 290 for the year. For all gas companies in this state for 2019, unrepaired leaks were 15,728 and 11,400 more than one repaired for a total of over 27,000 leaks throughout the state. Uh, National Grid is uh, overall in the state about almost uh, 3,500 leaks behind in terms of unrepaired versus repair. The Future Act resonates also with key parts of Beverly's sustainability policies, those that pertain to renewable energy and low carbon buildings. The Future Act actually is sponsored by 53 Democratic and Republican legislators and it's bipartisan because Senator Minority Leader Bruce Tarr is one of its sponsors. As you know, Gloucester has had in the past some tragedies in the, uh, as well as Marblehead, tragedies because of gas. 
The Future Act covers three main areas. First, in light of the Merrimack Valley disaster, it focuses on the decrepit gas infrastructure, also focuses on environmentally significant leaks, the ones that emit the most gas that have the biggest impact on greenhouse gas uh, uh, leakage. It enhances safety in school zones and improves winter leak surveillance because most leaks occur in the winter or appear in the winter. It provides prompt notice to local fire and police departments on infrastructure leaks and failures to enhance your ability to safeguard your residents. It improves record keeping, GPS positioning, and quality of inspections. And very important, it addresses worker and resident safety issues that were revealed by the Merrimack Valley disaster, particularly by making sure gate valves and boxes and shutoff valves are inspected, repaired, and maintained in their location recorded. Uh, they couldn't find many of them in the Merrimack Valley. And finally, it has independent certified inspectors. For the municipalities, it gives you greater participation in DU decision, DPU decision making regarding your service areas. It gives you more control over managing street openings. It brings the DPU, you can bring to the DPU complaints regarding your gas company now. It also gives you recourse to the DPU for gas leak damage to trees and seek recompense from the gas company which in some towns is a very big expense because they lose a lot of trees killed by gas. It also requires the EU to include in its decision-making public health as well as public safety. Public health is not in this mandate, but it will be if you pass the Future Act. Now, a key provision is that it provides gas utilities with the opportunity and incentive to build clean, safe, healthy, and sustainable renewable energy future by deploying and implementing technologies and practices that we all need now. And that means, again, new jobs. The technologies it focuses on, it allows and enhances the franchise of gas companies to deploy geothermal energy districts, as well as paving the way for heat pump technology to replace gas in the, in the, in the homes. Um, there are electric air and ground source heat pumps for heating and cooling. There are hybrid hot water heat pumps, electric flash, electric, and solar thermal. And then there's, of course, induction stove tops to replace cooking, which be coming down in price. It, all those technologies, which are not being implemented by households all over the state on their own because of the market forces, that gives a pretty clear message about the future of gas in the state, as well as the Maura Healy's recent petition of gas companies to the DPU to investigate the gas industry in Massachusetts and where it ought to be going. As you go to and from your home, your business or stores in Beverly, you're going over underground gas lines and accompanied too often as I am in Cambridge by the smell of leaking gas and the sight of dying road out roadside trees. If you think of that, just think of what Merrimack Valley went through a couple of years ago. So please consider this resolution. I hope you can pass it and join the transition to non-emitting clean renewable energy, thermal energy by supporting the Future Act. Thank you, and I'd be willing to answer and able to answer, hopefully able to answer any questions you have. Thank you, Mr. Wall. Any questions before we move on to Mr. Hobbs? Okay, thank you so much. Uh, Fred Hobbs is here. Mr. Hobbs, where are you? Hello, yes, thank you, Council President and uh, Council. I actually just wanted to introduce Ed, um, and he is the co-author of the, of the legislation. And it's these kinds of um, actions that I've always been interested in bringing into the public forum, such as yours. And this kind of bipartisan bill is the kind of thing we need to move the city and the state forward in terms of reducing our addiction to fossil fuel. So I was really just going to introduce um, Mr. Wall, but um, th that's all I had to say. Thank, oh. thank you all. Okay, I needed to go to you first. I apologize. But that's okay. I would have figured you had a little more to say, but thank you, Fred. And I know you're no, always. I always appreciate your time. I know how busy you are. Always looking out to what for what's best for our city. Um, Council Flowers. Thank you very much, Mr. President, and uh, and thank you to Mr. Wall for being here and uh, Mr. Hops for introducing him. Um, so I, I will read the resolution, but I do want to also just say that um, a, a thank you to uh, our mayor and to many of you who are on the council before me and have been doing the work of 
um, and to our Clean Energy Committee, bringing Beverly towards being an increasingly and ever increasingly green community and moving towards clean energy. One of the things that really stood out to me about this opportunity that, that we have to join other communities in supporting this, this future act is that not only does it meet our initiatives as a clean energy and green community, but it also, uh, as you heard Mr. Wall say, it also is really good for our residents. It's good in terms of giving municipalities, empowering municipalities um, in terms of updating gas infrastructure. And as we've all heard, um, Mayor Cahill, we've heard you and Commissioner Collins talk about, we've, Beverly has been fortunate to be able to sort of work aggressively and proactively um, with our utility companies, but I think increasing safety for workers, increasing safety for our residents um, is, is both a plus and part of what I think we're about here as, uh, as public servants. So I, I will read this um, and appreciate you giving me the time and Mr. President, thank you for allowing me to present. So whereas the city of Beverly has a long history of supporting and adopting green and sustainable initiatives and has established a sustainability framework and organized citywide initiatives, including resilience, mobility, renewable energy, low carbon buildings and solid waste management. And whereas the city of Beverly adopted in 2011, the stretch energy code to reduce energy bills for homeowners and businesses, the use of fossil fuels and carbon emissions and Whereas the city of Beverly has a clean energy advisory committee whose mission includes the need to reduce the city's reliance on fossil fuels, to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases and to promote, promote the use of emerging clean energy technologies in the city and, whereas the city of Beverly is one of the Commonwealth's green energy communities, and whereas the city of Beverly has an old natural gas infrastructure with 139 unrepaired leaks at the end of 2019, after 149 were repaired that year, and their locations are shown at Beverly Leaks heat map at heat and, whereas leaked gas is 95% methane, which is a greenhouse gas that causes 84 times more climate change, heating, than carbon dioxide over a 20 year period and, whereas methane leaking into the atmosphere knows no town boundaries and affects adjacent towns and neighborhoods where friends and relatives of Beverly residents live and, Whereas recent events such as explosions in the Merrimack Valley in September 2018 have demonstrated the safety and health risks inherent in aging fracked gas infrastructure and whereas leaked methane deprives tree roots of oxygen and kills shade trees, which otherwise improve the quality of life of Beverly's residents, provide protection for Beverly's residents against extreme heat and storm water flooding and increase property values and maintain the city of Beverly's property tax base and Whereas gas companies have not significantly reduced the number of gas leaks and the volume of methane emissions since the passage of Chapter 149 Acts of 2014, an act relative to natural gas leaks, requiring them to classify and repair leaks and ratepayers still pay for the lost gas. And whereas House 2849 Senate 1940, an act for utility transition to using renewable energy, the Future Act, addresses the problems with natural gas distribution in the Commonwealth by not only addressing crumbling infrastructure and immediate safety concerns, but also creating a path forward by permitting gas companies to distribute renewable thermal energy, including solar, heat pump, and geothermal energy, instead of explosive fossil fuels and incentivizes our utilities to transition away from using explosive fossil fuel as an energy source and looks towards renewable thermal energy sources and Whereas the Future Act will empower municipalities to have a stronger, safer, more transparent working relationship with public utilities by improving coordination for gas leak repair, mandating that utilities notify the local fire chief and police department within an hour of finding a dangerous leak, requiring gas companies and Department of Public Utilities to share maps, costs, and plans with municipalities and the public, and requiring that gas companies, requiring gas companies to be an audited annually for safety, performance, and leak reports and Whereas the Future Act will allow individuals and municipalities to claim property damage from gas leaks, including damage to trees, and whereas the Future Act will mandate that gas leaks within a certain distance of a school zone or building or within the root zone of a tree be fixed within six months, and whereas the Future Act calls for the equitable and fair deployment of clean energy regardless of income level, and whereas the Future Act will authorize municipalities to procure local or 
district energy services and to establish an energy microgrid. And whereas the following 15 municipalities have passed resolutions supportive of the Future Act, Arlington, Boston, Brookline, Cambridge, Concord, Gloucester, Hopkinton, Lexington, Lincoln, Newton, Somerville, Wellesley, Wellfleet, Weston, Weston and Worcester. And whereas the Future Act is consistent with and supportive of the clean energy and environmental practices and policies of the city of Beverly, and its endorsement by the city council advances the city's current practices and policies. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the city, that the Beverly City Council go on record in support of the Future Act and urge the legislature to pass the bill in the 2019-2020 session, and be it further resolved that the city council be and hereby is requested to forward suitably engrossed copies of this resolution to members of Beverly's legislative delegation, as well as House Speaker Robert DeLeo, Senate President Karen Spilka, and Governor Charles Baker on behalf of the City Council. Thank you, Council Flowers. Thank you. Uh, obviously, this is something that we want to support. Uh, are you comfortable? Council Houseman has asked that we wait for his to vote on his resolution till the 29th. Um, what would you what would you like to see happen? I would be open to whatever you think is most convenient with the question, and I think this maybe is, if it, with your permission, Mr. President, um, I don't know if Mr. Wall might have more information about when the deadline to vote on this at the state might be. Uh, let's check. Mr. Wall, you got a question. I heard the question. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, the the value of having the Beverly vote on it earlier than later is that we then uh, can say Beverly has now supported this because we have several resolutions for several towns right now that are pending. But that's not critical. I really respect your process. I know that Gloucester suspended the rules to do it in one session as opposed to two, but I totally respect your process. Um, mainly because I've got a gut feel for it. I grew up in Wendell, and I used to caddy at my opie as a kid, so I, I know the character pretty well. Um, uh, and I uh, used to get 25 cent lobsters down the Beverly Pier when I was a young kid. Um, so uh, uh, I used to, it, was a, it was a great time growing up up there, and, uh, and I wish I uh, sometimes come back. We still go to Gloucester from time to time with the summer place up there, but I totally respect what you're what your process requires and would defer to whatever you think is appropriate for your community. Thank you. Well, just as a side note, probably when you were a kid, my wife's grandfather sold lobsters down at the pier, so you might have bought them from him. No, I also, you know, I also work for the DiPaolo family, you know, the little uh, farm stand in the corner. I worked for them two summers with Eli, with Eli and his mother and his grandfather out back. I used to snitch some wine out of the keg in the back garage as a kid at the time. He told me how to, he, he could make anything grow. <laughs> well, you learned how to work, that's for sure. Well, I'm comfortable uh, asking for a motion to approve this resolution. Do I, I would make that, I would make that motion, Council President. Um, how about a second? A second. second. All right, Ms. Kent, roll call. Ames? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Brady's? Yes. Houseman? Houseman? Yes, for Houseman. Rand? Yes. Rotondo? Yes. Guanci? Yes. Resolution passes 9 to 0. Thank you, Mr. Wall. Thank you, Council Flowers. And of course, thank you, uh, Mr. Fred Hobbs. Uh, let's move on to our next resolution. Council Houseman. Would you uh, like to yes. Let yes, Mr. Hear. President. I'm still talking. Sorry. Um, I would. Would you like to hear from your speakers you've invited in first, or do you want to read your resolution first? Uh, well, I, I'd like to uh, say a few words and then uh, hear from uh, Julia Long, and and then we can read the resolution. Julia Long and Wayne Miller also correct. Uh, uh, no, Wayne Miller is not speaking this evening. Oh, okay. So I'll, I guess maybe I'll take his place in, <laughs> in the lineup. So why don't you, you speak, we'll go to Julia and then you can read your resolution and then we'll refer that to the Committee on Public Services. You've decided we're gonna take that up on the 29th. 
Yeah, or we can hold it in the committee of the whole, if you wish, at your discretion, sure. Council President. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, just a few words. Uh, I just want to describe a little bit about municipal aggregation and how it works. Um, today, our electric utility national grid performs two functions for us. First, it buys electricity from various sources. And second, it delivers electricity along its transmission lines. For Beverly residents, National Grid is effectively an electricity monopoly, and each of us has a separate contract to buy our power from National Grid. Municipal aggregation takes control of that first function, that is, determining the source of our electrical supply. With municipal aggregation, a city government, working with a broker, uses uses the collective bargaining power of all of its residents, aggregating their joint purchasing power to choose where their electricity comes from. In a green municipal aggregation program, the municipality chooses to source its electricity in a way that will create demand for new renewable energy to be built and thereby lowering greenhouse gas emissions. And this is authorized by state law. National Grid would remain responsible for the delivery of electricity, that second function. It would continue to do that and maintain its poles and wires and provide all the other customer services with which we are familiar. And if a resident wants to stay with National Grid in its selection and its selection of energy sources, they can do that. Green municipal aggregation, um, on the other hand, adds that other piece to uh, the source which allows for the selection of sources from clean energy. Uh, gr uh, GMA or green municipal aggregation can also result in lower prices and better price stability compared with national grids price. As a result, according to the Metropolitan Area Planning Commission, which offers technical support to help cities like Beverly start GMA programs, the vast majority of participants choose to remain in the aggregation uh, program. In, by February of this year, 2020, uh, in the MAPC area, at least 28 municipalities have authorized or are running active green aggregation programs. And I'll just uh, name uh, six of them to give you a sense of the, the range. Boston, Gloucester, Medford, Situate, Waltham, and uh, 23 others. So um, this is a somewhat uh, involved uh, program. And um, I, I would like the council to have an opportunity, councilors to have an opportunity to learn more about it before they take a vote. Um, so as council president uh, mentioned, um, I'm asking that this uh, resolution be, a vote on this resolution be held until 29th. Um, and um, would ask that we hold the resolution until then for a vote. And I've also asked our budget analyst, Jerry Perry, to sort of look into the concept so that if there are any questions on the 29th, um, that um, that he might be able to you know to answer them. So uh, without further ado, I'm 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 pleased to introduce uh, Julia Long uh, from the uh, Beverly's uh, Clean Energy Committee. She is the new and current chair. Ms. Long, thank you. Great. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for supporting the the Future Act so wholeheartedly. That was really exciting for us to see. Um, and I won't take too much of your time. A lot of what Councillor Hausman just stated was similar to what I'm gonna say, but um, but we all learn in different ways. And so I'm gonna make a quick statement. And then if you have any questions, we can, we can talk about those. Hi, I'm Julia Long, Chair of Beverly's Clean Energy Advisory Committee. Thank you for offering me the opportunity to address the council. Mayor Cahill has asked that we speak to you about green municipal aggregation. Green municipal aggregation or GMA is an, uh, an evolution of something called community choice aggregation, a mechanism by which municipalities can choose their sources of electrical energy. And this, initially, community choice aggregation was intended to facilitate the process by which communities could reduce costs by pooling together or aggregating the purchase of electricity for the community. Green municipal aggregation has the added goal of increasing the percentage of renewable energy provided to the municipality. When green municipal aggregation or GMA works as intended, municipalities and their residents and businesses pay less for electrical energy, decrease carbon footprint, 
and importantly motivate new local renewable energy projects and regional infrastructure to fulfill increased demand for green energy. This week, at the request of Mayor Cahill, members of the Clean Energy Advisory Committee will reach out to each of you to offer materials and information sources to allow you to further understand GMA. As Councillor Hausman said, it, it is slightly complicated, but there's a way to understand it. As soon as June 29th, the hope is to formally resolve the city's intention to thoroughly explore the process, benefits, and ramifications of adopting GMA, as well as to discover any drawbacks or unintended consequences that may accrue. The Clean Energy Advisory Committee strongly believes that preliminary information certainly indicates that GMA would be great for our city and that now is the time to initiate the process. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Long. Any questions? Comments? Uh, Council Houseman, would it be worthwhile for you to read your resolution this evening or would you prefer to wait until the 29th? I know you're a little shy. Sorry about that. Uh, okay. Yeah, no, I can go ahead and read it this uh, this evening to sort of queue it up for the councillors. Good idea. Okay. Um, whereas in 1981, Beverly High School was one of eight sites in the United States that then President Carter chose for a solar panel installation. And in 2011, the city of Beverly sought and was designated a green community by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And the city of Beverly completed a climate change vulnerability assessment and adaptation plan in 2014, recognizing that the threat of climate change to Beverly's infrastructure, vulnerable populations, emergency preparedness, economy, energy infrastructure and natural resources, and whereas more recent municipal actions already taken are impressive, a 5.5 megawatt solar field on, a former, on our former city landfill, a new police station to be powered by clean energy, GMO thermal for heat and solar for electricity, and support for transit-oriented housing districts to support the need for, uh, to reduce the need for using motor vehicles to live and work in our city. And whereas Beverly has committed itself to be a leader in the fight against global warming, to assume a responsibility, to set a positive example for other cities and towns to demonstrate what is possible in this effort. And Whereas in Mayor Cahill's 2019 State of the City speech, he began his address and discussed at length the city's need to address climate change, quote, because of the urgency of the issue. And whereas in his address, Mayor Cahill rhetorically asked, how can residents and businesses work to decrease our reliance on fossil fuels? And what role can we as a city government serve to facilitate these efforts? And whereas, the city of Beverly was recently awarded a $100,000 municipal vulnerability preparedness action grant from the Commonwealth to complete a comprehensive climate action plan in conjunction with the city of Salem to reduce green with the goal of reducing greenhouse gas emissions with an implementation plan. And whereas the climate action and resilience plan is based upon a 15 month project timeline to develop the plan and whereas the city council has consistently par partnered with Mayor Cahill on his efforts and initiated his own actions to advocate for, for sustainable clean energy policies. And whereas the city of Beverly voted unanimously, excuse me, the, the Beverly City Council voted unanimously on November 20th, 2017, to pass order 549, a resolution entitled Pass Pathways to Municipal Clean Energy, wherein the council resolved that the city will endeavor to take actions to promote clean energy and reduce reliance on fossil fuel. And whereas the, the Beverly City Council has also resolved in order 549 that the city of Beverly quote, join with other municipalities to collectively expand the clean energy infrastructure and move as quickly as possible to achieve that goal. And whereas with all our commitment and with all that we have accomplished, one important straightforward widely acceptable and effective action is missing. It is an action that will not, uh, not only place no burden on city residents, business and taxpayers, it will both reduce fossil fuel use by everyone who lives and works in Beverly and save them money. Since 2014, 150 of the state's 351 municipalities have either implemented or in the process of taking this action. 
and whereas the question is what is that action and why cannot the city take that action immediately and whereas the answer to that what is green municipal aggregation a free market contract that establishes community-wide rates for green energy that saves money for taxpayers while also shrinking their carbon footprints and whereas mass.gov describes municipal aggregation this way quote the process by which a municipality purchases electricity in bulk from a competitive supplier on behalf of the residents and businesses within the community and whereas municipal aggregation has four components one a municipality procures competitive electric supply on behalf of participating customers two a municipality may join with other municipalities to procure competitive supply three customer participation is voluntary so the municipality will provide customers with an opportunity to opt out of participating of the municipal aggregation program uh, customers who do not opt out will automatically be enrolled in the aggregation program four the electric utility company will continue to provide electric transmission and distribution services to participating customers and whereas in a green municipal aggregation program the municipality not only chooses the energy supplier but negotiates what percentage of the energy purchased comes from renewable uh, sources massachusetts law requires that all electrical supply to contain a minimum percentage of clean power 22% in 2020. Most municipalities that choose green municipal aggregation opt for an additional 5% of renewable energy, and some have opted for up to 30% required renewable energy source. Whereas the answer to why cannot the city make that take that step immediately is simple. There is no demonstrable reason why the administration and the council cannot embrace and start the process uh, to implement green aggregation green and municipal aggregation now. And whereas it can take more than a year and a half to implement a green municipal aggregation program for a community that is starting the process for the first time, um, but MAPC has developed green municipal aggregation programs successfully many times, and it is readily available now to provide technical support to Beverly along with the Department of Public Utilities. And whereas the Beverly and Salem Climate Action and Resilience Plan is based on developing a plan that will not be issued until the passage of no less than 15 months from now. Therefore, be it resolved that the City Council agrees with Mayor Cahill that climate action, the climate change is an urgent issue and does reaffirm the Council's own order number 549 of 2017 to, quote, join with other municipalities to collectively expand expand the clean energy infrastructure and move as quickly as possible to achieve that goal close quote and therefore let it further be resolved that the city council stands ready to receive and does request the administration to one direct the appropriate departments to research develop and participate in a contract or contracts to aggregate the electrical load of the residents and businesses of in the city of beverly independently or in joint action with other municipalities and provide by the end of the calendar year 2020 all documents necessary to accomplish same or otherwise report comprehensively by that date on the status and concrete steps taken by the administration and the city to achieve municipal green municipal aggregation end of resolution thank you council Hoffman. um and we look forward to voting favorably on that on the 29th. Thank you, Council President. Um, Council Ames, Mary Saris, has she joined us? I believe she has joined us by phone. Um, okay. Mary, are you here? Yes, I am here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, yes, excellent. Thank you so much for having me today. Right, Mary, it's your turn. I'm sorry? It's your turn. It's my turn. Thank you so much. Well, I appreciate the invitation to participate and provide you with some information about our current uh, labor force, labor market um, crisis that we are in, and to uh, let you know how the workforce board and our career centers can help you with this. I know you have a very busy agenda, 
So I did send out a PowerPoint early this morning. I'm not sure if the members of the city council have that available to them while I speak, or if I should just go through it on my own. Yeah, I think that you can go through it. And if we have any okay. questions. Thank you so much. Um, again, there's a lot of data here, which I hope is helpful to you when you get a moment to, um, to digest the information. As you all know, in March of 2020, the unemployment rate in the United States was 4.4%. The unemployment in Massachusetts was 3.0. The unemployment on the North Shore was 2.9%. And in Beverly, it was 2.4%. We have true labor shortage. Uh, and companies across the whole region were desperately trying to figure out how to find talent and to hire people to work for them. But of course, in mid-March, the um, COVID-19 health crisis struck, and the governor made some decisions, uh, rightfully so, that to protect our health, but really have uh, turned our economy completely upside down. In, the, in April, the unemployment rate for the U.S. went from 4.4% to 14.7%, which is the highest, the highest, I believe, it has ever been. Massachusetts, again, from 3.0% to 16.9%. The North Shore from 2.9% to 17.1%. And the unemployment rate in Beverly went from 2.4% to 14.3%. The May data is coming out. Uh, the, it seems to have gone down. The unemployment rate in May for the U.S. You probably read this one from 14.7% to 13.3%. And that is reflecting some of the uh, return to work orders that have been allowed across the country. The state data and the local data, unfortunately, is not available until this, the end of this week and the beginning of next week. So we're all very interested in seeing what the unemployment rate is like. But needless to say, we know and we, re we realize that this has taken a great toll <clears throat> on our economy and, the, and on the residents of the, of the North Shore. The, just quickly, one other statistic or two other statistics to give you a sense. When w there is a, a slide in the PowerPoint that shows layoff UI claimants by industry as of May 30th. The largest industry affected, of course, has been the accommodations and food service industry, with 18% of all unemployed, unemployment recipients in Beverly coming out of that industry. There's been about 4,500 people in Beverly right now collecting unemployment. Again, accommodations and food service, the biggest industry. The second largest industry is the retail trade, where about 15% of all UI claimants are out of that industry. And the second, believe it or not, is healthcare with, with 15% coming out of healthcare. As busy as healthcare is, they have laid off a certain share of their population, of their workers that aren't involved in the COVID fight. And so there have been layoffs within that particular industry. That we see turning around primarily as the need for COVID beds have been reduced within the hospital, which is a good thing, and they are now beginning to hire back. Other industries, you'll see this data when you get a moment uh, to look at it and get a handle on what it means to Beverly and for the people who live there who are currently out of work. So, the, the biggest, uh, the big statistic that also is out, and I'm sure you have heard this, is that this particular recession has really hurt low wage workers. That 55% of all people collecting unemployment on the North Shore were earning less than $700 a week when they were laid off. And another 20% were below, um, were between $1,000 a week and under. So this, this Definitely, this particular recession has had a big impact, again, on low-wage workers, making it even more scary and complicated by people who are trying to make a living, trying to put food on the table, and trying to um, survive on the unemployment insurance 
that they're receiving. Of course, the federal government is supplementing unemployment right now with an extra $600 a week added to everybody who is collecting unemployment, all federal dollars flowing through the state. The bad particular subsidy is ending on, um, on um, July 25th. That payment will be going away at that time. There is talk in Congress about continuing it, but it's a very, very controversial point at this point, and we do not see who can read what Congress is going to do, let's face it, but we do not see necessarily that um, extra payment being continued at this point. So, of course, the North Shore Career Centers stand ready to help, and there's contact information within the PowerPoint. So, if people are looking for um, employees, looking for businesses, there's a phone number and an, an email to contact us for that. Basically, the North Shore Career Centers remain open. However, they are only open remotely so that there is no walk-in traffic in our Career Center in Salem, Lynn, and Gloucester. We have converted all of our workshop content to webinar format. So if you go onto our website, if you're looking for work, we can definitely um, provide the learning environment for people to begin to think about how to get ready to go back to work. We have been putting some people into training. We have funding that allows us to provide training uh, to help people get retooled and back into the labor force. Of course, we, since this has just begun a couple of months ago, we don't have the demand we usually have for training, but we do see that increasing very shortly. From a company perspective, we have been working closely with several companies who are actually hiring people. For instance, Eastern Bank is hiring, and we had a virtual hiring event for them a week or so ago where about 15 job seekers were able to meet with the, the uh, HR department of Eastern Bank and then begin discussing potential jobs there. We're also planning in the end of June, of, uh, June beginning of July, a rather large manufacturing virtual hiring event where people can participate. We have seven manufacturers lined up so far to participate, and we anticipate uh, probably four or five more before the event begins. Of course, these events are new to everybody. People are not really even sure how to behave in the events, but we think we're going to get used to it and that this will be a great way for companies to meet workers, workers to meet companies, and from there, the interview process can bloom. We hope to reopen the career centers to face-to-face -face, uh, uh, assistance sometime in uh, the end of August, beginning of September. So, but in the meantime, we urge anybody, any company, or any job seeker who needs help to give the phone number and or the email a try for us and um, to begin to provide assistance to actually get back to work. Just quickly, you know, we continue on. We have training programs in manufacturing and apprenticeships in manufacturing continuing. We, we are going to be having some increased focus on healthcare training as the healthcare industry opens up. So people who are out of work, who are interested in going to work in healthcare and Many, many uh, the kind of care facilities, the community health centers, the acute care facilities have all, all told us that they have begun to hire and they do need people to go to work for them. So we really ask people to consider a career in healthcare. We know several people are nervous about that, going to work in this environment with COVID still around. But um, we also know lots of people are interested in careers in healthcare. It's a growing industry, and we know we'll be able to help people get into employment and get the training they need to continue that. We also have a summer youth program going on this uh, summer, uh, for primarily for low-income youth, although we do help other youth find employment. There will be some traditional summer jobs work uh, with nonprofit organizations that are set up to socially distance and to help the youth uh, work in that environment. But we also are going to have some very interesting virtual learning opportunities for young people. 
where they will be paid a stipend while they go about just doing research around different careers. Um, they, there's lots of kind of exciting virtual projects all lined up for these teenagers. So we hope with that they will we'll be opening an online application very shortly, and we're looking forward to serving the teens under those conditions. So anyways, um, the, um, there's lots of other things we can talk about. We are here to help companies and job seekers. And I would probably end there. The PowerPoint has a lot more information in it, but I know you probably want to read it and, and uh, let me know right now if you have any questions that I can help you with. Sure, Council Ames would like to ask a question or make a statement. Sure. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. President. Um, first of all, thank you so much for coming in and providing us with all this information. Um, and you and your team doing what you do. I know how hard you work, for instance, in the manufacturing sector. I know how important the workforce training programs are um, across the re region. And, you know, privately we have shared that you, you know that many of the jobs that have been lost will not be coming back. So I think the resources and the expertise that you provide are really important right now for counselors who really have their boots on the ground and can make a difference. And I just know how easy you are to access, but you know, I and you definitely have such a challenge ahead of you. Just the the numbers of people who are out of work is just staggering. And I am really happy to hear how many training programs um, you have running so that hopefully people can trans transfer from being out of work into a new career. Thank you very much for your time. Uh, of course, thank you so much for having me. Um, we do foresee the uh, people uh, needing perhaps at least temporarily to change careers, if not permanently to change careers. Uh, we, of course, who knows what the next year is gonna be like within um, the labor market and um, where things are going to be in those industries that have been highly affected by it. Many restaurants are opening up, as you know, to outdoor dining right now. And so we're watching that carefully and helping people move back into the employed situation as fast as we can and as quickly as people are interested in doing that. Um, and that goes the same for the retail trade and again for the healthcare industry. Manufacturing had a little, a few layoffs. It was about 5% layoffs out of manufacturing. Um, a lot of it uh, had to do with uh, manufacturing that was not, um, for instance, medical device companies that were not making tools that were needed in the COVID crisis. We see that turning around now, again, now that those beds have cleared out, people are gonna be going into the hospital for other types of surgery, hip replacements, knee replacements, cancer screenings, all of those things that have taken second place to the COVID crisis. So um, we do see that industry again turning around and the manufacturing associated with healthcare turning around. So um, we've been fortunate in that regard, we're lucky to still have that industry and again, hope to, to uh, help people make decisions about where they might want to work in the future. Thank you, Ms. Harris. Hopefully the next time we invite you in, we'll all be back in city council chambers. I, I would love that. I'd love to come back and visit and have a more uh, in-depth conversation with the counselors about what you see the need is in Beverly and how we can help because Great. we truly want to help. And I know all of you have met people, your constituents who are struggling and who are out of work. And uh, please feel free to have any of them call us at any time and we will do our best to help them. Right, and uh, it would be a miss. The same, with your, the same with the companies within Beverly who have let go of people and now want to start hiring again. Great, thank you. And thank you, Councilor Ames, for extending that invitation on behalf of the city council. Um, let's move on to our next agenda item. We have a public hearing scheduled for eight o'clock, but before that, I would entertain a motion to accept the minutes of our previous meetings 
which were held on Monday, May 18, 2020. It was a regular meeting. And then Monday, June 1st, 2020, a regular meeting. And the minutes of our finance and property committee, the whole uh, budget hearing, budget uh, presentation on June 4th. It was a special meeting. So moved. So moved. Second. 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 Ms. Kent, roll call, please. Ames? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Brady? Yes. Houseman? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. Wansi? Yes, great job. We got a lot of work done in that hour. Now we're on to our first, as you know, our public hearing that was scheduled for 7:15 on order number 110, the special permit application for Briscoe Village LLC has been rescheduled till June 29, 2020 at 7:15. So I'm going to call to order. I have my gavel. Our next public hearing at 8 p.m. on order number 114. Ms. Kent, could you please read that? Order number 114, dear Honorable City Council, I respectfully request that you approve a transfer from the Golf and Tennis Enterprise Accounts undesignated fund balance into the Golf and Tennis Operating Budget to address an expected revenue shortfall for FY20. Upon expiration of the existing management contract, the city went out to bid for a new agreement. Unfortunately, that process produced a bid that offered less annual revenue than anticipated, creating a budgetary shortfall. Additionally, the COVID-19 pandemic has kept our golf course closed and not producing revenue for a significant portion of the spring. As a result of these circumstances, I request a transfer of $205,000 to cover the cost of operations through June 30th and prevent a budgetary shortfall for FY20. Sincerely yours, Michael P. K. Helmier. And our finance director, Brian Ailes, would you like to make a comment on this one? Can you hear me now? Yeah. You can. All right. I had to switch uh, media here. Um, <laughs> thank you for your patience. Thank you, Mr. President, members of the council. Um, the order uh, is pretty self-explanatory. Um, we typically don't have these types of situations where we've had uh, unforeseen circumstances force uh, this particular enterprise fund, along with the one we're going to discuss next, um, to have spent a significant amount of their budget uh, on fixed costs and the like uh, up through the end of the fiscal year at a point in time where we typically bring in the bulk of the revenue for these enterprise funds. We typically realize 100% uh, of the revenue for the golf and tennis enterprise fund in, um, in the springtime when golfers are out on the course, members are paying up their dues. Uh, we know that hasn't occurred um, due to the pandemic um, and as a result, we've kind of overextended, um, or I should say, spent what was originally appropriated, and now there's a delay in the revenues coming in. So this transfer would alleviate that issue and um, avoid us having to have what's called uh, in Division of Local Services a deficit, uh, a, revenue, a revenue deficit at the end of the year, which is something we, we need to avoid. Um, the, the function of this is effectively taking funds from the enterprise fund retained earnings account, which was certified at $455,000 last June 30th. It's taking 205,000 of that money, placing it into the operating budget uh, for costs effectively that have already been occurred. If there is any money of, uh, left over at the end of the fiscal year, it will go back to that balance. Um, and so um, that, that's kind of how functionally it works. Happy to answer any questions you have, but I'd appreciate uh, you voting this favorably this evening. Thank you. Uh, budget analyst, Mr. Perry, do you want to make a comment also? Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Good evening, uh, members of the council. Uh, I wrote to you on June 11th, a quick memo on this matter. Uh, I, I agree with everything that the uh, uh, finance director indicated. The only thing I would add to his comments, um, uh, it's called a retained earnings deficit by regulations of the Department of Revenue. What would happen is if we go into a deficit, if it were to occur, um, what happens is that when they set the tax rate next November or December, the city would be required to raise funds from the general fund to offset this retained earnings deficit. So in essence, uh, 
we could be taking I don't know, valuable and, and short revenue that we have away from other budgets. So what the administration is doing in a proactive approach is trying to make sure there is no retained earnings deficit, not only with this one, but as well as the recreation. And uh, I think it's a very wise decision. And uh, uh, we will be seeing fund balances dropping a little bit uh, because of the COVID-19. This is to be expected, certainly in golf and tennis and recreation. Wouldn't be surprised if there's another one or two that comes along, but I don't. we're hoping they're not. But the bottom line to it, my recommendation is to do it. It's a smart decision, keeps us out of trouble. And uh, Mr. President, I'm more than happy to answer any questions people may have. Thank you, Mr. Perry. Uh, Council Flaherty would like to speak. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. I have a quick question. How, does any onus fall on the company that's running the golf course? It seems to fall on us, or is it the cost of doing business? Um, I just want to have that answer. A few people have asked me that question. Mr. Real? Thank you. Um, great question. We've been in constant contact with our management company. Um, we've worked very closely with them over the past multiple years um, that they've held the contract. They're a very reputable, reliable company um, that due to the pandemic has shown their um, shortfalls on, on their operations side. So what we're expecting at this point is more of a delay in terms of recognizing the revenue, a delay that will go beyond June 30th. And that's why we need to make this transfer. The hope is that the full value of the contract ultimately will make its way to the city but unfortunately it will be next fiscal year when we've already incurred the costs this fiscal year. So this is somewhat of a temporary measure. Um, I will say that the, the contract um, does have certain uh, clauses in it that may come into play. Um, we haven't had those discussions with the, the vendor yet. Uh, there is a force majeure uh, clause in the contract that has been brought up a few times. Um, but at this point in time, we're working collaboratively to try to work our way through this issue um, and haven't really sat down to talk about the legal aspects um, of the of the obligations of the contract. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? So the question for Mr. Perry and Mr. Rails. Hearing no further, do any members of the public wish to comment on this one? Hearing no further questions or comments, I'll Close our public hearing, refer that matter back to the Committee on Finance and Property and the Committee of the Whole. And um, I would entertain a motion to approve Mr. Ailes' request. So moved. So moved. Second. Ms. Canna, roll call vote, please. Ames? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Brady? Yes. Houseman? Go. Uh, yes. <laughs> Rand? Yes. Rotondo? Yes. Blancy? Yeah. Uh, nice work on that one. We have a few minutes, so I would, before our next public hearing, so let's go to communications from His Honor the Mayor, Ms. Kent. Okay. Order 131, dear Honorable City Council, I hereby reappoint, subject to your review and recommendation, Jessica Winstrand, attorney, 65 Lexington Circle Swanskit to serve on the Council on Aging and respectfully request that you waive the residency requirement. Ms. Winston is an attorney with the Beverly Law Firm on Glossky and Glossky and her experience is invaluable to the City Council on Aging. Her term is to be effective June 30th, 2020 until June 30th, 2023. Sincerely yours, Michael P. Cahill, Mayor. Um, please refer to the Committee on Public Services. Order number 132, dear Honorable City Council, I hereby reappoint subject to your review and recommendation, Mr. Kevin Cecilio for Sherwood at Lane, Beverly, to serve on the Beverly Golf and Tennis Commission. His term is to be effective until February 1st, 2023. Conceal yours, Michael P. Cahill, Mayor. Please refer to the Committee on Public Services. Order number 133, dear Honorable City Council, I hereby reappoint subject to your review and recommendation, the following citizens to serve on the Human Rights Committee. Mr. Salvador Demercio, 14 Chevy Road, and Principal Gabrielle Wanavecchi, 
at the Hannah School 41R Brim Lab. This term, these terms are to be effective until April 4th, 2023. Sincerely yours, Michael P. Cahill, Mayor. Please refer to the Committee on Legal Affairs. In order number 134, dear Honorable City Council, I hereby appoint subject to your review and recommendation, Ms. Darlene Wynn, Planning Director, to serve as trustee of the Beverly Affordable Housing Trust. Ms. Wynn will fulfill the term of former planning director, Aaron Claussen. Her term is effective until January 31st, 2022. Sincerely yours, Michael P. Cahill, Mayor. And please refer that to the Committee on Finance and Property, and we'll take those up at our next meeting. Uh, Ms. Kent, are you ready to go to motions and orders? Yep, I am. One sec. Okay, um, order 121. Be retained by the City Council of the City of Beverly as follows. Ordered in the year 2020, an ordinance amending an ordinance entitled Chapter 270, Section 46, 30 minute parking. Adoption of this amendment can be made by adding the highlighted line in Section 270 46 as indicated below. Section 270 46, 30 minute parking. It was last amended on December 18, 2017, by Order Number 524A. No person shall park a vehicle for longer than 30 minutes on the following street or portion of the street. Goat Hill Lane, north from Fox Court to the Cabot Street from 8 a.m. to 6.30 p.m. The first reading was on June 1st. Then it was an ordinance to take effect upon publication and final passage, which final passage is tonight. And, um, no, I'm sorry, final passage is on June 22nd. Any questions or comments? Question comes on the acceptance of the proposal and the adoption of the ordinance. Um, Ms. Kent, roll call, please. Ames? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Brady? Brady? Yes. Huffman? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And Guanci? Yes. Want to keep going? I do. Okay. Order number 128. Be attained by the City Council. I mean, City Council of the City of Beverly as follows. Ordered in the two year 2020, proposed order amending Beverly Ordinance Section 113 2, possession of consumption of alcohol on public ways, in public places, or on private property, by adding paragraph C as set forth below, Section 113 2. Possession of the consumption on public ways, in public places, or on private property. A, no person shall drink any alcohol beverages as defined in M Mass General Law, Chapter 138, Section 1, or carry or be in possession of any open bottle or can container in alcohol beverage as defined in Mass General Law, 138, Section 1. While in or upon any public way or any way to which the public has a right of access or any place to which members of the public have access as invitees or licensees, park or playground or private land, building structure or place without the consent of the owner or person in control there. All alcoholic beverages being used in violation of this section shall be seized and safety held until final injunction of the charge against the person arrested or summoned before the court, at which time they shall be returned to the person entitled to lawful possession. B, the section shall not apply to any place duly licensed to serve alcoholic beverages as defined in Mass General Law 138, Section 1. Notwithstanding paragraph A, Beverly restaurants may be allowed to operate and serve alcohol on city sidewalks and parklets, parking spaces, public ways, or other public, public places, but only upon approval by the Health Department, Municipal Inspection Department, Planning Department, Public Safety, in accordance with standards established by the Planning Department. As such use, is further subject to review and approval by the licensing board, including conditions imposed by such board. This paragraph C shall sunset and be no further force in effect as of 11.49 p.m. December 31st, 2020. And this was in the newspaper on June 5th, 2020. Okay, Councilor Rotundo has recused himself for this order, so I would ask any questions or comments. Question comes on the acceptance of the proposal and the adoption of the ordinance. Uh, roll call, please. Mine is Okay. Yes. Yeah. Feldman. Yes. Flaherty. Yes. Flowers. Yes. Yes. Brady. Yes. 
Houseman? Yes. Rand? Yes. And Guanci? Yes. And let's move on to our final one. And Miss, uh, uh, we have our city solicitor keeping an eye on us and all you need to read is the amended language. Oh, that's good, okay. I should have told you that earlier. That's all right. The amended part of this one is? Door to 129. Uh, yeah, I'm on 129. I don't know what just the amended language is, so I didn't read it prior. We'll read the whole thing. Okay. It's paragraph E, Mr. President. President, thank, thank you, Senator. Okay, the order and be attained by the City Council of the City of Beverly as follows. In the year 2020, ordered amending Beverly Ordinance Section 192-61 sandwich board signs by adding paragraph E as set forth below. Notwithstanding paragraphs A through D, sandwich board signs may be displayed without a per permit issued by the City Council, but only upon approval by the Municipal Inspections and Planning Departments in accordance with standards established by the Planning Department. This paragraph E shall sunset and be no further force in effect as of 11.59 p.m. on December 31st, 2020. And this was also in the newspaper on June 5th. Okay. Final passage tonight, June 22nd. Any questions or comments? Uh, question comes on the acceptance of the proposal and the adoption of the ordinance. Uh, roll call, please, minus Rotundo. Ames? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Brady? Yes. Houseman? Yes. Rand? Yes. Guanci? Yes. I'm sitting here shaking. I got all nervous when I heard Miss Williams' voice. <laughs> but we're glad that she's here to keep us on track. I'm happy. Our, ne our next public hearing is uh, now. It's 8:15 on order number 118. Miss Kent, could you please read that? Dear Honorable City Council, I respectfully request that you approve a transfer from the Recreation Enterprise account, undesignated full ba fund balance, into the Recreation Enterprise operating budget to address and expected revenue shortfall for fiscal year 20. The uncertainty of the summer programming connected to the COVID-19 pandemic has resulted in increased revenue during the spring months. The spring revenue compromise, compromises a significant portion of the annual revenue for this account and this transfer will address the impending revenue deficit for FY20. I request a transfer of $125,000 to cover the cost of operations through June 30th, 2020. Please initiate action at your next city council meeting by a public hearing. Sincerely yours, Michael P. Cahill, Mayor. And that public hearing we're in the middle of, Mr. Hale. Thanks again, members of the city council, Mr. President. Um, this is very similar to the one we just discussed 15 minutes ago, uh, only this one relates to the Recreation Enterprise Fund. Um, what's notable about the operations of this fund is that uh, typically the expenses occur early in the summer months, so July, August, during the camping months, typically. Um, and then in the spring, you get the prepayments for the following summer. Um, and we know what situation we're in uh, right now, and the, the revenues just aren't materializing enough to support the expenses that occurred earlier in the year. Um, so similar to the golf and, and tennis enterprise transfer, this recreation fund balance transfer would avoid a revenue deficit uh, or as Mr. Perry referred to, a retained earnings deficit. Um, of important note is that uh, as of last uh, June 30th, 2019, um, the fund balance for this account, the Recreation Enterprise Fund, was certified at $340,518. So there's sufficient resources to afford this $125,000 transfer. Appreciate Thank your you. action on it this evening. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Mr. Perry, a comment? Not much to add, Mr. President. Uh, I agree with wholeheartedly with uh, Bryant on this. And same as the last one, I would recommend uh, you adopt the request of the administration. Thank you, sir. Uh, do any members of the public have any questions? Uh, how about counselors? Councillor Ames. Thank you. Thank you. I just have um, a general question about given the uncertainty in the economy, just um, 
I would think that this could cover what happens this year, but um, for both actually golf and for the recreation department, have you thought about a plan B or a longer term outlook? Mr. Ailes? Sure, I mean, we all talk about this on a weekly basis. The the situation's changing regularly, uh, right? And so um, what, what we know for certain is that these amounts aren't so large that they'll entirely deplete the fund balances. Um, so this is a short-term solution. Uh, a longer-term solution, if we continue to see the deterioration of revenue uh, through a significant part of the coming fiscal year, we'd need to make some restructuring on the expenditure side of the equation to better balance that um, going into next fiscal year. Um, however, the golf and tennis one is a little more difficult because we've got fixed overhead costs. We have actual debt service that that fund pays for related to borrowings that were done for course improvements and improvements to the building. The recreation doesn't have that fixed costs, but what they do have is costs that are directly tied to the level of activity that they're providing. So if you ultimately see a decrease in revenue, the, the, the logic is that the service levels will go down too. Maybe not as many programs will be offered, or maybe um, you know, there's not as much attendance going on, so the costs go down um, convert in, in conjunction, excuse me, in conjunction with the revenues. The problem with this account is that there's a delay. You know, you, you spend the costs in the fall, and you bring in the revenue in the spring. And that's why um, we're facing this problem. But if we continue to see the revenue decline and, and fall off as we have, we'll need to restructure the expenditure side of the equation. There's no question. No, I, I understand you don't have a crystal ball. So you're not exactly sure how this will turn out, but thank you very much. Thank you, Council Flaherty. Thank you, Mr. President. I have a question for Mr. Ailes. Uh, it, it's kind of related question about COVID-19 and what we can spend our money uh, with COVID money that come in. I think it's be $3.7 million. The idea of what we can do with that money, and it was a misleading um, headline in the paper the other day about how we're going to raise taxes and we're not going to avoid layoffs. Um, now, can you kind of kind of go into that a little bit, what we actually can do with that money uh, and what we're legally obligated to do? People are, are hurting, but I think people need to get an understanding of uh, where we are and how we're going about it. Sure. I'll, um, I'll speak in some very broad um, general uh, terms. Um, I would be more than happy, though, to schedule uh, a more robust discussion, if it pleases the council and Mr. President, um, about this, where we can bring in some of the experts that have been working on this day in, day out, reviewing all the regs, the, the boatloads and boatloads of information that we've been getting on a, on a daily basis effectively, um, and give you a much clearer sense. But in general, the way I conceptualize the CARES money as well as the FEMA money is that the FEMA money is really designed to uh, address the immediate uh, emergency that's in, our, that's in our forefront right now. So. The second we started closing down, you know, businesses and the economy started uh, getting affected, we had a major health crisis on our hands. If we needed to hire additional staff to, to manage that health crisis, if we had additional police officers patrolling, you know, for various reasons related to enforcement of the new regs that were coming out at the state level, those are all costs that were added above and beyond what we originally planned our, our year to spend, right? And so because they're added costs associated with the management of the, the crisis, those are going to be FEMA eligible. And 75% of those expenses are going to come back. The vast majority of those types of expenditures are PPEs, um, which were needed to purchase at the start of the pandemic, um, as well as a lot of kind of overtime hours and additional staff hours that were required to help manage the, the process. Then comes in this second layer of CARES Act money. And this is money that the, feds, the, the federal government um, allocated to the state of Massachusetts and the administration and finance secretariat oversees the further administration of those funds and distributes that out to all the cities and towns based on uh, population. And so the allocable portion for Beverly was 3.7 million. 
Now, these funds can be used for the same things that the FEMA money was used for. Um, and in fact, we can use this money to cover the 25% match that the FEMA expenditures will not cover, okay? Um, in addition to the FEMA uh, allowable expenditures, there's this kind of secondary level of expenditures that are allowed related to added costs kind of post, post the emergency. So we're kind of through the initial triage phase of the emergency. And now we're at a kind of management phase where we need to kind of restructure the way we do certain operations, whether that's education, whether that's our camps, whether that's uh, city government in the business we're doing now. Um, all of those things need to be modified as a result of the new regs um, and, and the new social distancing requirements that we know are important to maintain public health. And so any costs that are kind of add-ons or unforeseen in nature are going to be most likely eligible for this CARES Act money. So it's really about in, enhancing the services we deliver to deliver them in a more effective or more health conscious way. So for an example, this is uh, an example that kind of resonates with some people I've talked to about it. Bruce Doig, who uh, oversees the rec department, may have uh, camps that still go on this summer. And in a typical summer, he may hire, I don't know, 40 camp counselors to handle the typical population that would come through. But in this environment, he may be required to maintain a staff to participant ratio much higher than he had before to ensure the proper social distancing and things. So if he has to hire 80 part-time counselors, well, in that case, the 40 additional part-time counselors would likely be eligible for the CARES money. However, the initial 40 are already contained in his budget and you can't use the CARES Act money to supplant expenses that have already been budgeted or already have another funding source. So that's a very simplistic way to look at it. It's really about the added costs that come with administering um, kind of government in a new way as a result of the COVID issues. Is that helpful, Counselor? Does that give you some guidance on it? I, I appreciate that. I, I know the concern was, you know, that we shouldn't go up the, for the full two and a half percent and that we should probably go to two percent. Um, that was the kind of concern that we should use that money uh, for that. I think that helps clarify that uh, for, for me. So some early on guidance, Counselor, to, to add to that, uh, that we received from ANF and from Division of Local Services was that these funds cannot, cannot be used to supplant lost revenue or replace lost revenue. So you can't backfill holes with it. It's about added costs. It's not about lost revenue. Well said, Council Flaherty. Thank you. Uh, how about Council Feldman? Yes, thank you. Um, I had a kind of just understanding the budget, I think, question in terms of the recreation budget. Um, are you saying that the money collected in the spring in terms of camp registrations and things was used for cash flow in the FY20 budget, even if they were camps that would be run in FY21? And is that the norm? Is there deferred revenue in terms of accepting registrations and using that as cash flow um, for the next fiscal year? And is that how it always is allocated or is this just for this year? Yes, that's, uh, you obviously uh, have some accounting background, uh, but yes, that's exactly what it is. It's much more of a cash basis um, accounting. So yes, that revenue we collect in the spring balances the books for FY20, even though the expenditures don't occur necessarily. Well, some of them do, you know, through July, but August and September, um, I'm sorry, July and August are going to be next fiscal year. So yes, you're, you're correct in your assumption. Okay. And it's the Thank typical you. way we do it. Okay, thanks. Uh, Mr. Perry. Yes, Mr. Perry, I was just uh, want to go back very briefly, Councilor Ames's question um, about the plan B. I thought it was a pretty good question. I just want to refresh the council's uh, memories. The uh, golf and tennis 
budget was uh, the request coming before you when you finally vote was dropped by about forty thousand dollars. It went from four twenty to three eighty. So I think that's part of Plan B, Councillor, just to you know anticipate less revenues coming in. And of course, there'll be other plans, if you will, if we have to address it. But I just wanted to refresh your memories on that area. With regard to all the other uh, CARES uh, questions and the accounting, I, I totally agree with what the finance director indicated. He's spot on with his uh, answers. So I just wanted to add that to it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Perry. Anybody else? All right, hearing no further questions or comments, we'll close our public hearing. Um, and then I would entertain a motion to approve Mr. L's request. So moved. Second. Second. Ms. Kent, a roll call vote, please. Ames? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Brady's? Yes. Hosman? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. Guanci? Yes. And now we are on to our final public hearing of the evening. Ms. Kent, could you please read that order on number 125? Order number 125, that the City of Gov Council of the City of Beverly hold a public hearing on Monday, June 15th at 8.30, remote on Google Meet, live stream on BevCam relative to the Community Preservation Committee, seventh round CPA project funding recommendations, phase two. And this was public uh, hearing. Mr. Oh, sorry. That's okay. All good? Good. Ms. Rails, do you want to make a comment on this or should we go right to somebody from the um, CPA committee? I defer to the CPA. I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Great. And the chair, Marilyn McCrory, is here. Marilyn, thanks for joining us. Uh, good evening, President Guanci and members of the council. Um, uh, thank you for. Uh, considering our recommendations for funding tonight. Um, I just wanted to uh, point out or acknowledge other members of the CPC who are here tonight. Um, can, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, Heather Richter, uh, Derek Beckwith, Robert Buxbaum uh, are here from the committee and uh, Denise Deschamp, our very able staff person is also here. Um, uh, as I mentioned, the last time we were before you in May, um, we opened our uh, seventh round of funding in November, um, and we've been deliberating since on the applications. Uh, you have already uh, approved funding for three of the projects we brought to you last month, and we're here tonight with um, the remaining recommendations for funding um, for two of the projects. Um, and, and one uh, special initiative related to uh, emergency housing assistance um, for related to COVID-19. So um, uh, that's what we are uh, presenting for um, uh, your consideration tonight. We're happy to answer any questions. Um, and um, I, uh, I also wanted to point out that I think two of the applicants are, are here as well, um, Fred Hobbs and Mary McCaffrey. Uh, Marilyn, can you just uh, just quickly touch base on what each of the projects are before we open it up to questions for those people watching? Sure, home. sure. Um, the first, oh, uh, absolutely. Uh, the first project is uh, for restoration of the perimeter fence um, at the Beverly Farms Cemetery, and that's the Beverly. Farms Improvement Society in cooperation with the city. Um, they've already started uh, the restoration of the fence at, at uh, using other funding sources. So they have come to the uh, CPA to help with um, additional funding for uh, more of that um, project. And um, uh, this is in the historic preservation category, obviously. Uh, the second project is to preserve some original solar panels and restore the inverter house at the solar array at uh, Beverly High School. And that's also in the historic preservation category. Um, the uh, funding amounts are, I believe, in the letter uh, that the committee submitted to the council. Um, 
Um, and um, let's see, the third project then is um, uh, something that uh, came up uh, obviously in the course of the, the current emergency. Um, this is to establish a, a, temp, a, a an emergency relief uh, fund for housing uh, for those who have been affected by um, uh, COVID-19. Um, and as we, the committee established a subcommittee to look into that, um, used for that. Um, Heather Richter and Derek Beckwith uh, were uh, involved in that subcommittee and uh, recommended to the, to the CPC and the CPC approved uh, establishing a fund of, um, is it, I think, $241,000 uh, yeah. for this, this purpose. The final final um, transfer is? I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat the question, please? And, and the last one is to authorize a transfer of $28,501 from the CPA unrestricted fund balance to the CPA Historical Preservation Reserve. I, yes, I, I believe that's an account, you know, an accounting issue that perhaps yep. uh, anybody else could address if there are questions. Okay. Mr. Rails, that's something we need to approve, correct? Correct. That's uh, to address um, a previous authorization that was authorized by those two accounts um, and the balances weren't there sufficient to support the appropriation. So we're just transferring money in from another source to cover it. Great, thank you, Mr. Rails. Um, do any other members of the uh, CPA committee wish to make a comment or uh, say anything about all your work? Oh, you're easy. All right. President, President Guanze, I might uh, suggest that perhaps uh, Heather Richter or Derek Beckwith uh, could just give you a little background, if, you, if you'd like, um, on the, um, the housing issue. I think that that would be great. Uh, Ms. Richter or Mr. Beckwith? Don't be shy. We're, we're all right. All right, I guess. Oh. Ms. Rickus, since you were the chair, do you want to make a comment? Do you hear me now? We hear you now. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that. I'm a little uh, technically challenged. Um, on yes. We, um, so we came to this, um, the conclusion, we did an assessment of need in Beverly based on some um, seminars that we had attended um, that were run by the CHAPA organization and mass housing um, and so on and so forth. And we came to the conclusion that um, A, we could use our part of our funds for um, housing relief, mostly rental relief, and B, that um, we felt that there would be a need that would probably arise a little later in the um, in the crisis, um, once the uh, moratorium on uh, evictions is challenged, I, I saw in the paper that it had already been challenged. And once the six hundred dollars from unemployment runs out, there are going to be a lot of people who are going to need some help. Um, what we had planned had. Um, Taking advice from all these other the cities and towns that have um, that have uh, already put plans in place, we had uh, put together a, a number of parameters. And I don't know if everybody's read the report that we sent out, but I can read some of those. Um, a local agency with experience in administering housing relief programs would be selected to administer the fund. The agency was selected would propose a structure for the selection process. There would be the lowest possible administrative fee from the par partnering agency. Funding would be for rental assistance um, or for um, mortgage, mortgage assistance only on deed restricted 
low income housing. It would be limited to City of Beverly residents, households would be 100% of AMI or lower. There could only be one application per household. Um, there would need to be proof of income. There would need to be proof of residence, obviously, domicile. And um, these people would have to be ineligible for other forms of rental assistance. And um, at the end of the day, after much discussion, we landed on a sum of $240,000, which, which represents approximately 50% of the amount remaining in our general reserve. And it would be available for three months after the state of emergency ends and to be reviewed subsequently every three months by the CPC in collaboration with a partnering agency. Africa. Next steps would be to invite comment from you guys from the city council and um, hopefully get approval to go forward and select an agency. Great. Do any Derek, members did you have anything to add? Mr. Beckwith, anything to add? All right, let's go to members of the council to see if we have any questions. And we have um, Councilor Rotundo. Thank you, Mr. President. This is Richter. Um, in regards to the 240000 for the rental assistance due to the COVID pandemic, it's a great program from what I've heard from speaking with you and uh, Mrs. Marino. Um, for a couple of things, is have you found out what organization you may be using? And then the other thing is, is this something maybe in the future going forward where, um, you know, the economics of everything longer than say two months, three months, it may go several years. Is this something that we could consider as a city to explore expanding upon this? Not so much necessarily even from just the CPC aspect of it. Ms. Richter, put the, uh, we can't hear you. So we had initially oh, reached out to organizations we have not made a final selection as yet we did not want to exercise these organizations unnecessarily until we knew um, that the council had approved the appropriation what we'll probably do um, next steps would be to identify to reach out to all of them one more time and really identify the agency that fits best with our parameters uh, as regards Going forward, I think that would be a fine idea. I think it would be a wonderful thing if, if we could prolong this and have um, other sources of funding added to it, um, as long as you know we stay within the CPA guidelines and within the law as far as the money is spent. Okay, and I do have one other question, um, Mr. President, if I may ask, it's in sure. different um, part of the uh, CPA grant. Um, yes. Question I had was I know there was one other applicant that uh, was submitted back in December, and I, we hadn't seen anything. I actually was expecting to see something about it. I don't know if Mrs. McQuarrie may be able to answer it. I believe it was uh, Mr. Slater, our former city uh, clerk, had submitted some um, uh, requests for refunding for the um, continuation of the preservation of the binding of the books. I was familiar with that. I'd sat in several meetings when I applied for the Livingstone Park project. So I was just curious to see what that happened to that application. Why? was in the consideration. Uh, Mr. Uh, President Guanzi, I can uh, I, I try to address that. Uh, we, um, we had several meetings, uh, several meetings where we discussed the, um, all of the applications, but uh, the, the application from the city clerk's office for funding of the restoration of uh, city documents, uh, we spent a uh, uh, an entire meeting discussing, and we de we decided uh, as a committee to not fund the project this year um, for several reasons. Uh, one of which was that um, the funding that was awarded in round six last year hadn't really been uh, begun yet, or the work on on that that part of the uh, project hadn't begun yet. The bid had actually just gone out. This year, and I do understand um, from uh, former former city clerk West Slate that um, that that was due to some administrative delays. 
um, not necessarily, you know, from uh, uh, the city clerk's uh, uh, responsibility, but um, nonetheless, the, the, the funding from last year was not spent. The, the committee also had several questions about the application, several concerns, uh, many of which have been brought up over the years that we have um, funded um, the city documents restoration. Um, and uh, it was felt that it was a good time to take a pause. Um, we also had pretty much depleted the historic, res uh, uh, historic preservation um, pot of money in the CPA funds. Um, it mainly, um, we felt that this was a good opportunity to take a pause. There's still um, a substantial amount of money that is, remains to be spent from last year. Uh, that project is essentially just starting. Um, so those, those are some of the reasons, um, Councilor Rotondo, that we decided to decline funding the project this year. Can I ask how much in that pot for the historic um, was for the CPC that was allotted? In general, just the I'm total not, pot, not per, but it, basically I know you have four sections of the CPC that you allot money and funding for. How much would have been in the uh, historical part of it? Um, balance, uh, you know, every year 10% uh, of the total revenues um, uh, collected uh, is set aside in three categories, um, historic preservation being one of them. We've probably ha had more historic preservation projects than any other category. Um, Bryant, uh, Ailes, perhaps you can um, answer the question. Um, we started, started this year with a balance I'm looking at the latest um, project, Mr. Ailes, and it's a little unclear to me. Um, but I, I think we okay. I've, we I've been pretty able much to call it up here, so I depleted uh, that, that part of it. Yeah. Um, so overall, since since inception, including the FY20 budgeted revenue. There has been six hundred and ten thousand seven hundred and fifty nine dollars made available for historic preservation. That's out of six point one million. Right, and I think uh, uh, as of as of today, um, if the vote uh, before the council is made um, to transfer the funds we requested, um, the balance available will be zero in that reserve. Thank you. Yeah. All set, Councilor Rotundo. Uh, Council yes, Mr. House President, Mr. thank you. Councilor Houseman. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Mr. President. Um, yeah, I, I want to speak briefly about each of the three. Not the most, not the not the recent conversation, but the three that are up before us at the moment. Um, the uh, given what the city's legacy and history is, and its uh, steps and commitments uh, being taken toward uh, addressing climate change, I think it's uh, very appropriate for the city to support the the application. To spend money for preservation of part of the uh, solar field up at the oh, up at uh, BHS. Um, as to the the Beverly Farms cemetery fence, um, you know I, I think that's appropriate. I I, I speak as uh, for a moment, uh, particularly though as a Ward Four City Councilor, um, because for a long time and I've I've had conversations with Mike Collins about this. Um, I have wanted to try to address in some fashion the uh, the state of the fence at Central Cemetery, and and Mr. Collins and I have um, uh, tried uh, and are still trying to find um, uh, photographs or some material that would give us a basis for making a restoration of that fence based upon historic uh, designs. Uh, we're still working on that. 
Um, and uh, so I both uh, empathize with what's happening uh, with the application for the Beverly Farm Cemetery and hope that that will serve in some fashion um, uh, as, a, as a basis for comparison when we're trying to uh, hopefully in the future, uh, get CPC funds for restoring the fence around Central Cemetery, which in some places is really absolutely deplorable. Uh, and then finally, um, on the the um, the housing piece, I would just say, um, I, I, when when this first happened, I went to our budget analyst and said, listen, is there anything on the city side that, that we can do to dry, try to address this kind of need? Um, and neither one of us, neither one of us, came up with CPC as as a possible source for funding, uh, because in in all avenues, uh, Mr. Perry advised me the city really could not sort of get into the uh, I don't want to call it the business, but uh, you know, be in a position to provide this kind of support. So I, I applaud the sort of the, the creativity and the addressing of the need by the CPC to provide this kind of funding. Uh, to Councilor Rotundo's question, I, I, I in and Ms. Richter's uh, comment about, you know, doing something like this going forward, I note that in the the comments from the various different agencies, one of the agency which, which uh, made a response was Harbor Lake Community Partners, which, in you know, indicates. Uh, let's see, um, I'll, I'll just quote it: um, Local funding is an essential component of every project. That um, the CPC, uh, excuse me, the Harbor Light uh, is involved in, and it would prefer to balance immediate needs against the needs of future projects. So this is really a unprecedented immediate need, but for purposes of going forward, I think we have to really deliberate the balance between providing immediate need under these circumstances and at the same time um, preserving our flexibility to be able to fund uh, housing projects such as those that um, uh, Harbor Lake Community Partners and other agencies like it uh, engage in and want to bring to our city as well. And with that, I'll, I'll end my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor House. Thank you. I'm sorry, President Guanci, were you, did you call on me? I did, I said Councilor Rand. Thank you, it kind of broke up at the end there. Um, I appreciate it. So I uh, wanted to thank both Ms. Richter and Mr. Beckwith for putting in the extra time and effort for putting together um, or organizing this uh, use of CPC funds, um, CPA funds. Early on, I think we were on one of the first couple of Zoom calls that, that um, talked about using CPA funding for rental assistance. And it sounded like there are a lot of communities who have been doing that and also started to do that just recently. And I just wanted to say that's important work. And also to just make note that um, having reached out to both um, Mickey Northcutt and Mr. DeFranza about their thoughts on that, they did express that there it's important that we have funding for all types of housing and while they're in the business of developing affordable housing that is distinctly different from providing rental assistance for people so uh, it is worth continuing the conversation about but i really appreciate the work that you've done on that um, and also just in general the cpc committee is one of my favorites for their level of organization and thoroughness. So thank you. Thank you, Councilor Ran. Uh, Councilor Frades. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. I just wanted to uh, give my wholehearted endorsement for the Beverly Farm Cemetery proposal and just a little bit of a backstory. Um, a lot of credit goes to Diane Kelly, who I my guess is six, seven, eight years ago reached out and wanted to do something with that fence. Uh, we talked and put our heads together. We had such a great community uh, that came together over the Pete's Park. So we proposed something similar to that where people would do some scraping, sanding, painting. Uh, we actually organized a public par uh, partnership 
private partnership with Waters and Brown. Not only were they going to donate all the materials, but they were also going to supply the experts uh, because they had done the same thing at the Salem Commons. Well, when we approached the administration, especially Mr. Collins, it turned out that it was a no-go because of all the lead paint and it would expose everybody to that. So unbeknownst to us, another group was raising funds. Uh, Mary McCaffrey is her name, and she was leading a different approach uh, uh, to raise funds, uh, take sections of the fence, and actually get them uh, deleaded and restored because they go back, I think, about 150 years. So Collins got the blessing. He uh, cut off a couple sections of fence. They traveled to somewhere in Everett, and uh, apparently it's, a, it's an amazing restoration and they're doing fantastic work. So I can't uh, uh, say how much uh, I appreciate the support of those groups as well as what hopefully will be a, a productive uh, vote. The other thing is uh, to comment on the, um, the solar uh, inverters. You know, uh, I know the arrays were brought up to speed and they're capturing a tremendous amount of uh, energy. And yet with those inverters being clogged, uh, somebody said the best they can produce is a third of what uh, power is being produced. So how can we as a community say that we're the first and the best, and we're talking about all this great stuff tonight, the futures and the green, if we're not going to support that? So just a few comments. Thanks so much. Great comments, Councilor Freitas. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Ames. Thank you. These are really wonderful projects, and thank you for all your hard work and bringing them up to us. I had um, a question about the um, rental assistance. Um, number one, I commend you. I am always way behind any kind of program that can directly support uh, people in the community. But I was just wondering, um, how did you envision um, picking the agency? And then from over there, and it sounds like uh, you have a lot of um, a lot of great organization and oversight there, but did you have a plan for oversight and just um, even just how this would be marketed? Because I would hope since they are community dollars that it would primarily be marketed as a Beverly fund. Thank you. Um, it, absolutely, it would be a Beverly fund. And we've had lots of conversations about how we get the word out to the Beverly residents. Um, you know, we hopefully all the councillors will be um, talking about it on their website. We did have a little newspaper article already. And, um, you know, the mayor does his COVID updates. We would ask him to maybe include mention of it in, in those. And um, in, in terms of, we would reach out again to all the agencies that we initially spoke to. And now that we have our parameters in place, we would ask them to maybe come back to us with a proposal based on our parameters. And from there, I think it, it'll probably be a pretty straightforward selection, would be my guess. Thank you. And if anyone has any um, input into, you know, agencies that we've maybe missed or haven't thought of, we'd be very happy to hear from you all. Great, thank you, Ms. Richter. Um, a couple of members of the public wish to make comments. Uh, I'm gonna go to Mr. Fred Hobbs first. Mr. Hobbs, you're still here. Oh, yes, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good. Well, so as the chairman of Solar Now, I'd like to acknowledge the uh, tremendous effort that the CPC puts together with Marilyn McCrory's chair and Helen Richter. You know, it was a rigorous process, but they're fair and deliberate. And it was it was really an honor to go through that process. Um, and um, I'm grateful for the recognition that this is a really a modern history that we're preserving here. And it's a unique research and development photovoltaic site here in Beverly. And so with the efforts of the mayor and also with the city council just to prove future and regarding the GMA, the, you know, we have the history and future of clean energy here in this city. And um, <clears throat> so, since 2004, the Solar Now Board has been working to preserve the legacy of that site. 
in Dr. Coleman's honor as well. But in the process of revamping uh, the entire field, we're going to be getting 10 times the amount of electricity up there as the old site produced. And so the effort right, right now to upgrade that site, we want to make sure that we're preserving the legacy. So, you know, we're going to get more than a megawatt of power up there. And so when Councillor Freddy's talks about the, um, the, uh, the production now, it's, it's going to be greatly improved when the site is revamped, re-energized. And so at Solar Now, we're trying to retain the legacy. You know, that is modern history. And it's been an inspiration to the solar industry. And we want to make sure that it retains its inspiration long into the future. So um, I, I hope that you can uh, support the, the grant funding that the CPC has. Um, um, I guess it's passed the CPC board and now it's to be voted by the city council. But it adds to the future um, generations to know what has gone before, you know, the modern history of the site. So I, I just want to conclude by saying the site will continue to be an inspiration for the clean energy future. And I uh, appreciate your support. Thank you so much to the council and members of the assembled. Thank you, Mr. Hobbs, and thank you for everything you do on a volunteer basis here in the city of Beverly. Well, I um, it's a privilege. Thank you. Mr. Slade, are you here? Here, Mr. President. Um, I just want to comment on the order uh, prior to your approval uh, to inform you of the absence from the list of the CPC approved projects of the historic document preservation application submitted by me as city clerk during this last round seven. Some of this you've already heard about and you have a copy of the statement. You may recall that a similar application was filed first by my predecessor, Mrs. Connolly, in rounds one and two and then by me after she retired in rounds three through six. This was to supplement the line item in the city budget, that's 11612-53414, in a big way as that line item never exceeded $10,000 and in fact has been defunded in the mayor's proposed budget for fiscal 2021. I know uh, Councillor Hausman uh, asked about that when you were talking about the budget last week. Over the years, the CPC has supported over $300,000 of restoration and preservation of our historic documents, allowing us to make real progress in this area. It was in no small part responsible for the four historic documents selected by the Smithsonian's American History Museum exhibit, which ended earlier this year after four years down there, and comments made by the council president and others during various meetings that this was exactly the kind of historic preservation the CPE was designed to support. Mrs. Connolly and I work closely with the CPC and their staff support, Amy Maxner originally and now Denise Deschamps, to submit an application each year and the documents restored and preserved speak for themselves. When the dates for round seven were confirmed, it appeared that they would coincide with my announcement of my retirement as city clerk. However, I did submit the pre-application last fall, which was approved and the final application, which was actually due on Friday, January 10th, my last day in the office. I attended, as Ms. McQuarrie mentioned, uh, uh, a couple of CPC meetings, communicated regularly with Denise Deschamps, and made it clear to the committee that even after my retirement was effective in February, that I would see this round's application through to its conclusion when the committee and finally with this council, hence these comments tonight. During their meeting on the 7th of May, the vice chair of the committee, Ms. Richter, stated that there were deficiencies in the application, as they mentioned, and that since the round six funding had not yet been expended due to delays in the purchasing process and the approval from the mayor, which is required, she was recommending that the committee not approve our round seven application. And after some discussion, the committee voted unanimously to approve her recommendation. This is why it is not included in the phase two funding recommendations in this order in response to Councillor Rotondo's question. 
I bring this to your attention because without that additional funding and with the line item in the mayor's proposed budget being zeroed out, it means that no additional work will be done on restoration and preservation of historic documents until at least fiscal 2022, if that line item is restored and if an application in CPC's round eight is submitted and approved when that comes around. I would point out that the round six documents that she mentioned that were part of the bid that went out were already selected over a year ago. So it, it effectively means that no new material would be, would be treated. You should know that I contracted with King Information Systems last year to do a complete inventory of the documents stored in the office, both in the two vaults, the one in the office and the one in the basement, and in the basement storage room. I'm just concerned that all our efforts will be stalled if nothing more is done in this area until at least fiscal 2022. And I would point out that I did um, uh, shift those materials over to Mrs. Kent, so she has all of that. Uh, documentation that was done by King and the and the previous work that was done in that area, so it's available. I appreciate your attention. I hope this clears up any confusion concerning the application, uh, the absence of the application in tonight's CPC fund uh, phase two funding recommendations. And I would point out, and you probably got this later, that Denise um, Deschamps did provide a letter uh, confirming the committee's um, uh, reasoning. Um, and I forwarded that to you in the clerk's office uh, after I received it from Denise this afternoon. Thank you. And we did all get that. And thank you for uh, making sure that Ms. Kent has that information for hopefully a submission in 2022. I know that the budgets were tight this year, and this is one of the things that uh, didn't make the final cut in the city clerk's budget. Uh, I have... Anybody else from the public? Any other councils have any questions? Um, uh, Marilyn, do you have anything before I close the public hearing? Uh, uh, I, I do not, President Bonsi. Okay. Hearing no further questions or comments, I'm going to close our public hearing, and then uh, I will read, uh, I will make a motion, we'll take these one at a time if that works. Mr. Rails, is that okay to do that? I think that's what we've done in the past. Vote separately on each uh, appropriation? Yes, Mr. President, that makes sense. Great, thank you. So I would entertain a motion to appropriate $70,000 from the CPA general reserve account to the city of Beverly's Department of Public Services for the purpose of restoring 271 linear feet of perimeter fence at the Beverly Farm Cemetery. The Community Preservation Act's spending purpose under preservation is to protect personal and real property from injury, harm, or destruction. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Second. And a roll call, Ms. Kent? Haynes. Yes. Feldman? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Frades? Resounding yes. Kelsman? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And Guasi? Uh, yes, and I know Miss McCaffrey is here uh, watching, and she's pretty oh, excited about it. I'm very excited. Thank you very much. We very much appreciate the support. No, well, thank you for all your hard work. Thank you. Um, so that passes nine to zero. I would now entertain a motion to appropriate $25,000, which will come from the CPA General Reserve account to the City of Beverly's Department of Public Services for the preservation of several solar panels in the inverter house located at the solar array adjacent to Beverly High School, 100 Sawyer Road. Uh, the Community Preservation Act spending purpose under preservation is to protect personal or real property from injury, harm, or destruction. Resounding, oh, sorry. No. Uh, no, I'm just gonna, uh, so moved. Second. 
Roll call, Ms. Kent. Ames? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Brady? Yes. Houseman? Resoundingly, yes. Rand? Yes. My line. Yes. And Guansi? Yes, and I want to thank Fred Hoffs for bringing up Dr. Coleman. What an amazing man he was. Uh, that was really his pride and joy, uh, that solar field. And uh, since he's been gone, he's definitely been missed. So thanks for bringing him up, Mr. Hobbs. He's smiling down on us now. I'm sure he is. Uh, next up, I would entertain a motion to appropriate 240000 which will come from the CPA General Reserve account to the city of Beverly to establish a fund to provide temporary housing assistance to individuals and families living in Beverly since February 2020, which have suffered a loss of income directly related to the COVID-19 pandemic. Eligible criteria would include, but are not limited to, individual families with an income below 100% of the area median income. The program parameters are included in the attached report from the Community Preservation Committee Subcommittee on Emergency COVID-19 Housing Relief Program. The program would be administered by a third party entity. The Community Preservation Act spending purpose under support is to provide grants, loans, rental assistance, security deposits, interest rate write downs, or other forms of assistance directly to individuals and families who are eligible for community housing or to an entity that owns, operates, or manages such housing for the purpose of making affordable housing. Great idea. I would entertain a motion. So, so moved. Second. Second. Beautiful. Uh, Ms. Call, please. Yes. Yes. Feldman? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Brady? Yes. Houseman? Yes. Rand? Yes. Latundo? Yes. And Guancy? Yes. Finally entertain a motion to authorize a transfer of $28,501 from the CPA unrestricted fund balance into the CPA historical preservation reserve and a transfer of $22,260 from the CPA unrestricted fund balance into the community housing reserve. Motion. So moved. So moved. Second. Second. Thank okay, you, Council. Um, roll call, Mr. Ames? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Brady? Yes. Houseman? Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. Wansi? Yes. Uh, thank you, members of the City Council, and special thanks go out to the Community Preservation our committee for all your hard work. It's amazing what you do and the projects we've been able to fund over the past five or six years have been uh, such a benefit to the city. Um, that concludes our public hearings. So I would entertain a motion to no, I don't have to do that. Uh, I'm going to ask Council Flaherty to call to order the Committee on Finance and Property. Mr. Ailes needs uh, myself. Council Flaherty and Councilor Rand to meet and vote on um, some bond stuff. Correct, Mr. Rails? That's correct, Mr. President. Okay, it's all you. Okay, I'd like to call the order of finance and property. Mr. Ailes, will you uh, please explain uh, what we're gonna we're gonna vote uh, five times uh, within finance and property? Uh, the rest of the council will not vote. I will ask for a motion in a second, and then. Um, for a roll call vote. So, uh, Mr. Ailes, can you explain to us what we're going to be voting on tonight? Sure. There's uh, a number of approvals that, that require the subcommittee's vote uh, per, um, I believe it's either charter or statute, uh, one of the two, um, that require the, the finance subcommittee to, to approve effectively some things that I as treasurer distribute um, in relation to uh, the borrowings that the city undergoes regularly. Um, so currently, right now, um, we have before us um, a series of bond anticipation notes that went to market uh, last week. 
um, the it's a, it's a public bid, um, and the winning bidder was J.P. Morgan Securities, and they uh, they bid to off uh, to loan us effectively uh, a bond anticipation note of thirty million five hundred seventy five thousand uh, dollars has a coupon rate of two percent. However, there's also a uh, rebate um, that, or a premium, if you will, that J.P. Morgan will advance the city, bringing the net interest rate uh, for the offering down to 0.2933%. Uh, and we will borrow the money for nine months, uh, at which point when it becomes uh, mature in March of next fiscal year, the intent at that point is to permanently borrow um, a lot of these, the big contingency is whether or not MSBA can close out the final audit of the middle school. Um, but the $30 million plus that we'll be borrowing are uh, effectively to facilitate cash flow. And that cash flow is used to uh, basically was to pay the last portion of the middle school. Uh, and then there's also some cash in here to advance uh, for uh, the payments related to the construction of the police station. Um, and then there are some other smaller um, loan authorizations that the council had approved um, that are also tied up in, in this borrowing. Um, is that sufficient in terms of an explanation, Mr. Chairman? Very, very sufficient. Thank you very much. Um, so we're going to take our first vote uh, of five. So bear with me. So voted to approve and confirm the sale of 30,575,002% general obligation bond anticipation notes of the city dated June 26, 2020 and payable March 26, 2021 to JP Morgan Securities LLC at par and accrued interest, if any, plus a premium of $391,360. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. May I hear a roll call vote? Rand? Yes. Wansi? Yes. And Flaherty? Yes. Motion passes three to zero. Second one, further voted that in connection with the marketing and sales of the notes, the preparation and distribution of a notice of sale and preliminary off official statement dated May 27th, 2020, and the final official statement dated June 3rd, 2020. Each and such form as may be approved by the city finance director or treasurer being hereby ratified, confirmed, and approved and adopted. Do we hear a motion? So moved. Second. Roll call vote. Brands? Yes. Wansi? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Motion carries three to zero. Third vote, further voted that any certifications or documents related to the notes may be executed in several compartments, counterparts, each of which shall be regarded as the original and of which shall constituent one in the same document, delivery of executed counterpart of a signature page to a document by electronic mail in a PDF file or by any other electronic transmission shall be as effective as delivery of a manual executed counterpart signature page to such a document. And electronic signatures on any of the documents shall be deemed original signatures for the purposes of the documents and all matters related thereto, having the same legal effect as the original signatures. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. Rand? Yes. Aye. Yes. Clarity. Yes. Sorry, Tim. Motion carries three to zero. Fourth one. Further voted that the mayor, the finance director slash treasurer, and the city accountant be and hereby are authorized to execute and deliver a significant events disclosure undertaking compliance with SEC rule 15C2-12 in such form as may be approved by bond council to the city, which undertaking shall be incorporated by reference in the notes for the benefit of the holders of the notes from time to time. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. Roll call. Rand? Yes. Wansi? 
Yes. Clarity. Yes. Motion passes three to zero. Fifth and final vote. Further voted that the mayor, the finance director slash treasurer, the city count and the city clerk be and here are hereby are authorized to take any and all such actions and execute and deliver such certificate, certificates, certificates, recip, recipients <laughs> of all documents it's determined by them and any of them to be necessary and convenient to carry into the effect the provisions of foregoing votes. I hear a motion. So moved. Second. Roll call. Rand? Yes. Wansi? Yes. Larity? Motion, yes, motion carries three to zero. Mr. President, we're all set. Uh, Motion just to adjourn finance and property. So moved. Second. All in favor, motion carries three to zero. We need a roll call. Did you do a roll call? Yes. 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 Okay, roll call vote. <laughs> Rand? Yes. Wansi? Yes. Clarity? Yes. You think it's easy, Flats, huh? <laughs> I gave it to you. <laughs> um, so that's all. Uh, we have one final agenda item, but before I uh, address that, I just want to say that our next city council meeting will be on Thursday, June 18th at 7 p.m. It is the public hearing for the FY 2021 budget. So if you know anybody, you've gotten emails or phone calls about the budget and people are happy or unhappy about it, now let them know now's their time to call in, uh, join our Google meeting and uh, talk about their thoughts on our budget for next year. On June 22nd, uh, the Committee on Finance and Property, we will take our, uh, our votes. Uh, myself, Councilor Flaherty, the Chair, and Councilor Rand. That is on Monday the 22nd at 7 p.m. And then we'll have the, a special City Council meeting to pass the budget on Wednesday the 24th at 7 p.m. And then, as we've already mentioned we will have a special city council meeting on monday june 29th at 7 p.m so we need to go into executive session so i'm going to ask for a motion do i have a motion to enter executive session pursuant to massachusetts general law chapter 30a section 21a3 so we may discuss pending litigation in the matter of burnham associates versus the city of beverly USDCMA case number 120-CV-11114-GAO. The purpose of the executive session is to discuss strategy with respect to this litigation. As council president, I declare that an executive session is necessary because an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the city's litigation position. The council will not reconvene an open session but will instead adjourn directly, adjourn directly from execu executive session. Motion, please. So moved. Second. Roll call. Ames? Yes. Feldman? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Flowers? Yes. Brady's? Yes. Halston? So moved. Yes. Rand? Yes. Rotundo? Yes. And Guatsi? Yes. So uh, thank you for everybody that turned in and uh, participated in tonight's meeting. And the council will go to the uh, private link sent to us by city solicitor Stephanie Williams. Good night. Good night.